Well, hello again. Uh, welcome to week nine. Good on you for hanging in this far. I hope you're managing to keep watching the videos each week and they're providing you some interesting and challenging ideas and things to think about as you consider yourself as a primary school teacher of mathematics. Um, in this week we're looking at evidence and although I'm sure you've looked at assessment and things like that a lot through your program up to this point, uh, we're specifically looking at evidence and then evidence that helps inform learning this week. So here's the preview. Uh, we'll look at what is evidence, what's it for, how much evidence do you need, and then um, how can you use that to help students learn. Uh, the lectures this week will be a little bit shorter because I'm going to give you more things to do outside of the lectures. Um, so the volume of learning is there, but more of it will be uh, follow up after. In particular, we're going to follow up some of the work of a, a British uh, educational expert called Dylan William. So you notice that I've used the word evidence and not so much data. And the reason is that evidence is broader than data. Data is important. In schools you hear a lot about data, people collecting data and using data, data informed things. And there's nothing wrong with data. It's just, in my opinion, not enough. So in, when we talk about evidence, we want you to think more like a historian or a journalist rather than a statistician. How can we understand what's happening here? And the data you collect, which is often numbers and things like that, will be useful, but it doesn't tell you the big picture. It doesn't help you understand what's going on. So we like to collect evidence, which is based on your professional judgment as a teacher, things you see and hear and notice as you go around the class and marks on rubrics and things like that. The other thing is the collection of evidence should be relatively simple and unobtrusive. One of the things that is important to always remember, and I'm, again I'm sure you've heard this before throughout your uh, course and your program over the last couple of years, you, you're there to be a teacher, not to be an assessor. So the assessment and the collection of evidence should be a part of your teaching practice as you go along, not something extra you always stick on the end. And if we think of uh, data and evidence and assessment as only as tests and formal things, then we're going to miss out on a whole pile of rich information that's always available to us as teachers as we try and plan what we do. But to do that, it has to be simple and relatively unobtrusive. You can't stop the kids all the time to collect evidence. Occasionally it's okay to stop the learning and take time out to do some sort of assessment, but a lot of this uh, evidence is available to you as you are teaching in the classroom. So it should be simple and unobtrusive. Your main job is there to be as a teacher. The evidence is to support you in that role as a teacher. So why do we need evidence? Well, as I just mentioned before, fundamentally it's about helping you do the best job as a teacher for the students that are before you in the class. But one of the things we hear a lot about is, oh, what's best practice? We're looking for best practice. But the best practice is a myth. There is no such thing. All we know might be best practice for these students before you today in this class in this year. There is no best practice that works in every school, in every class. You can get ideas of good practices, but then you're going to have to modify them and use them to suit the learners in your classroom. So while it's important to keep reading as you go through this program and then once you finish, all those sorts of things are helpful and ideas, but they're only to help you decide what is the best thing that the kids in your class need today. Um, so how do you work out what they need? Well, you need some evidence to find out what they can do, what they understand, how they're feeling about their learning, what their life experiences are, how they've coped with what they've done, so then you can design and carry out the best practice for them in that next moment. And the challenge for you as a teacher is so you often need to do this on the fly. So you can plan formal assessments and things like that. But a lot of the assessment and evidence you'll collect will be as you go around the classroom teaching. And this is why you need to have a good understanding of pedagogy <coughs> and a good understanding of the mathematics you're teaching. So you can see things, so you can comprehend what the student understands and knows in a moment and then respond. It's not like you can always say, sometimes you can, I'll take that away, I'll think about it and I'll come back tomorrow. Sometimes you need to collect the evidence and respond straight away. And this is hard firstly because our perceptions are always limited. So sometimes 
if we just go on our gut feel of what we think is happening, we might miss something. Uh, we don't always see things as they are. So collecting evidence helps us actually see what's happening and, ha and what the students are thinking and learning at the time. Uh, again, I, I'm sure I've given you examples before of lessons I thought were going really well and the kids were learning something really important. But when I collected a little bit of evidence about what they'd actually learned, I found it was something completely different from what I'd thought. So don't just rely on your perceptions. See if you can get some evidence, some simple things that will show you what's actually going on. And in the second part of this lecture, we'll talk about what some of that evidence might be. The other thing, of course, is the context of learning is dynamic and always changing. You've been in classrooms enough now to know that from one day to the next, the kids can be different based on a whole pile of things that might be happening in their life at school and outside of school. So you need to always be responsive to what's happening. How do you know what to respond to? By having some simple evidence that tells you what they're thinking and feeling at that time. Now, one of the terms you've probably heard about is called assessment for learning. Um, there's all sorts of uh, catch words and phrases and ideas about assessment, but one I think that's got a lot of traction and um, is quite useful, particularly as a teacher, is assessment for learning. And this is when we collect evidence and we use it to inform and shape the student's learning that follows. It's used to adapt and help us to uh, modify our teaching to meet the student's needs. Now, of course, when you go into a class, you'll have something planned. You'll go and you'll follow that plan. But you always have to be aware that sometimes your plan needs to modify it as you go. Sometimes the students just don't get what you thought they were going to get at that time, or they don't see something, or they don't understand it. So you have to change it. It's not like you can say, oh, hold on, students. I'm just going to take this plan away, take it home tonight, reflect on it, and come back tomorrow and change it. You need to change it as you go. And, and this will often be not just in response to your gut feel about it, but some sort of evidence you see in the students uh, while they're trying to do the learning. So assessment for learning is the moment by moment feedback for students as they are learning. It includes things like you'll see a student undertaking a task, you'll see them do something, and at that very moment, that task, what they've done, is gives you some evidence and you need to respond. You haven't got a long time to think about it, you just need to give them some feedback that will help them move forward. And that feedback has to vary depending on who the student is, what the task is, and where they're at at their learning. You might have a student who's doing really well, or, and generally does, does well in their mathematics, and so they ask you a question, how am I going? And your response to them might be, you know how you're going, you just need to uh, work it out. Then you might have another student doing exactly the same task who's always struggled with maths and lacks, lacks confidence, and they might say, oh, I'm not sure what to do. Now that student, you're not going to say, you know what to do, keep going. You might say, you've done a great job, I like the way you've done that, and here's the next thing to think about. So your feedback that you get from this quick evidence you collect as you're in the classroom will help you to respond in that moment to each of these students in different ways. And of course, this means you just need to know your students well, you need to know your content, your mathematics well, and you need to understand the teaching well so you know what little bit of feedback to give them the next time. Assessment for learning is a bit like looking out the windscreen instead of looking in the rearview mirror. So often when we do some sort of assessment, we're looking to see backwards. What have the kids learned? Where have they been? And that's important sometimes, not that often, but occasionally you do need to get a track of where they've been to record it for reporting purposes and things like that. But more importantly is looking at the windscreen. You're getting some feedback, you're doing some little bit of assessment or collecting a little bit of evidence to then help them know where to go next. And that's fundamentally what teaching's about. Understanding where the students are at, thinking what's involved and how can I move them forward. So this idea of assessment for learning is one that's gained popularity. And as I mentioned at the start, it's something that's been talked a lot about by uh, Dylan William. And he suggested there's five key strategies in this. The first one is when you're working with students, make sure you first of all clarify <coughs> what, they want, what you want them to learn. What's the learning intentions? That's a term I've seen a lot in schools these days. What do you want the kids to learn or to investigate in this particular lesson? What are they learning about? And that helps them sort of orient themselves towards something. The second thing is, once they're working on it, how can you engineer effective classroom discussions and activities 
that will also, as well as help them in their learning, give you some evidence of what they've learned and how they've learned it and where they're at. So this might be they might make something and you'll look at it and if you've asked them to make something with symmetry and you can see that it hasn't got symmetry or it's got something else, you can then see that evidence and respond in that moment. Um, they might write something down. So if you look at the writing, you could see what they've written and then that gives you some evidence about their learning and then you can provide them the next feedback so they can move forward or the prompt or, or maybe you just provide them nothing, just some encouragement. Uh, they might talk to you, you might ask them a question and they might answer it and from what they've said you can then provide the next thing they need in, through their teaching, through your teaching to help them move forward. So engineering, engineering discussion, sometimes it's good if you just listen while kids talk to each other. Uh, this will help you understand what they've learned because they'll talk to each other and often in language different from what you might have used and you've got to try and discern what that is giving you evidence about. The third part of course is providing feedback that moves the foot learners forward. And uh, previously we talked about the ZPD. So what you need to do is provide what do they need next just to move the next step forward. For some students that might be a very small step, for some students that could be quite a big leap. But you need to provide them some sort of feedback or encouragement or support. We might ask them a question or you might ask them to do something, or you might give them a clue or a hint, or you might give them a prompt that helps them move forward. The key here is not, of course, to do the task for them, but to give them the feedback that helps them do the task or do the learning in the next step. The, the fourth step in, in William's five keys is um, enabling students to help one another. Uh, one of the things that happens is students, you, you might explain something beautifully to students, uh, and they start working on it and then they put their hand up and they ask a question. And what happens is then you'll explain it exactly the same way you explained it the first time and the student's still none the wiser. So sometimes what's really useful is to get other students to explain it to them because they'll talk about it in different ways um, that help the students might understand better. So I would always encourage students to help one another. If nothing else, there's one of you and 25 students in the class Whereas if they help one another, the support is closer at hand. Uh, the other thing is if a student is explaining something to someone else, it's also good for them because they must understand it if they're going to explain it to someone else. So try and have classrooms where st students are enabled to help one another. And the last one is uh, what William calls activating students as owners of their own learning. So what in the end you want is students to discover and learn things for themselves and your job is to try and facilitate and create conditions so that they can do that. In simple terms it means just don't tell them stuff all the time. Because if you tell them something it's something they've, it's your knowledge that they've sort of picked up and they might learn, memorize it or, or understand it but they don't necessarily have this sense of ownership of it. Whereas what you want them to do is to discover something and see it for themselves and then have the excitement and the, uh, the thrill for themselves of learning something and understanding something, comprehending something. And if they do that, they're much more likely to remember it, to be able to use it and to understand it. So there's some strategies there that might be useful. I've only gone through them quickly, but if on the next two slides here, which uh, of course are in the uh, Learning at Griffith site, there's links first of all to two videos. And this is where Dylan William talks about assessment for learning. Uh, one's shorter and one's a little bit longer, but I think you'll find them really interesting and helpful. So I hope you've got the time to look at them and, and follow them up. The second one is some readings from the library. And these are both readily available. Uh, I found them, searched for them and found them myself. I suggest you find them and have a look and then have a read of them. So this week in this these lectures are going to be shorter than normal because I want you to spend more time reading these and looking at these two videos. Now I've put videos on every week I know but these ones I think are, you might find really useful and interesting. Not just for mathematics but for your um, teaching and learning in other subjects as well. Anyway I hope you find the videos and the readings interesting. Like we've said every week this course is not about giving you a recipe or a best practice about how to teach mathematics it's about helping you find your identity and your way, your philosophy, your ideas and how you're going to practice maths teaching. Um, and of course you can do that to a point at this stage but it will also depend on 
when you start your first job, the, the students who are in front of you and the school you're at. Anyway, good luck.